Well, good morning. Uh, here we are again on our favorite topic, side-by-side uh, -side vintage guns. And today I'd like to uh, share with you a gun that just came in uh, by W.W. W. Greener, well-known English maker. This is a 12-gauge uh, hammerless shotgun, as are most of his guns. Greener made um, a lot of guns. Uh, comparable to Parker in the US. Most of them were uh, box locks as is the case here and most were uh, low to mid-grade guns. He, he um, was not in the same class as Purdy and Holland who catered mainly to the royalty and uh, the <coughs> moneyed uh, gentry. Greener catered uh, to the working class and um, a lot of his guns ended up in uh, various corners of the British Empire, such as India, South Africa, and so on. Uh, this particular gun ended up in the United States, and uh, I'll spend a little time on it, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the restoration work we're going to do on the gun. It's a rather plain gun, um, but um, like all of these guns, a good quality gun. It's a very early gun. The serial number is uh, 33,000, which puts it prior to 1898, so it's an antique. Uh, it's easy to remember in the case of Green that any gun with a serial number below 50,000 is an antique, so um, <clears throat> it uh, is not considered to be a firearm under U.S. Uh, firearms uh, regulations. This gun has the characteristic WW Greener uh, side safety, which some people uh, like and some don't. I personally like it because it requires that you twist your hand and take your finger off the trigger to disengage the safety. Uh, it's also kind of uh, easy for a left-handed to operate. Um, so, uh, you know, so there you have it. Some people like them, some people don't. I uh, did make a few guns with uh, top safeties, but very few. Uh, the gun has what Greener called machine engraving, and he was a pioneer of uh, using machine tools to produce shotguns in the days when most shotguns were made uh, entirely by hand, or mostly by hand. And not only did he have parts machined by um, various suppliers and by his own uh, employees, but um, he also pioneered this interesting technique of engraving the sides of the action using a, um, a tool similar to the tool that's used to, uh, to um, machine a rib. And it's quite pleasing if, uh, you know, if somewhat um, monotonous. The screws on this gun are all lined north and south. Um, and up on the mark, it says to me that this gun has never been apart because it's inevitable that uh, if a gun is taken down or taken apart for repair or uh, cleaning, uh, the screws get messed up. Even the screws on the side safety are are lined up uh, to properly timed, as, as we say. So that's a plus. Uh, in addition, the checkering on this gun and the wood appears to have original finish and the checkering has the characteristic um, Flat tops uh, are, are vintage guns of, of that period, and it's very sharp. So this gun, I think, has seen not much use. It hasn't been carried much. And, um, you know, the trigger bow and so on have, has lost its uh, finish, which is not unusual for a gun of this age. But there's no pitting on the action. Uh, and uh, there are no cracks in the stock. So, um, all in all, it's uh, in excellent condition, uh, given that it's well over 100 years old. Now, the barrels uh, are Damascus, and um, they've lost their contrast. Uh, they've become a sort of a uniform dull brown, and I'm going to remedy that by um, acid etching the barrels. I'm not going to refinish them because they don't need refinishing. There's not a lot of 
ugly pitting or blotching on on them, even though there is some roughness. I can feel with my my fingers um, from corrosion, and that'll become more evident once we etch them. But I'm going to etch these barrels just to show you the um, how that how that etching can enhance the uh, contrast of the of the iron and steel in Damascus barrels. Uh, the barrels don't have any dents or bulges in them. Uh, you can usually feel them just run, running your hand up and down the the barrels. They're in good condition. The ribs appear to be sound. I don't see any separation. And uh, the gun has not been cut, which is a good thing. Um, you can usually tell if a gun has been cut because the uh, barrels should overlap a little bit at the muzzle. And there should be a little flat section there between between the two barrels and that is intact and there should also be metal steel not solder showing uh, in the little V's um, above and below the barrel and that's the case here so the barrels haven't been cut the boards are in good condition the gun does have a couple of issues that need uh, attention one is someone has uh, dropped the gun on its uh, toe and uh, crushed the wood as well as the uh, horn butt plate and lost uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, material so we're going to have to uh, repair that and that's unfortunate because horn butt plates are uh, impossible to repair uh, using the original material one has to use epoxy and that uh, is hard to do um, in a completely uh, seamless uh, fashion. The wood can be repaired with a fresh piece of walnut which will splice in. The second issue is the barrels are slightly loose on the action, which is surprising given that this gun doesn't appear to have been used much, you know, judging by the checkering and so on. Um, it then has the famous Karina cross bolt, which you see here, uh, this bolt goes penetrates this uh, rib extension here to give a third uh, bite, as the English say, or a third lockup. The, the first and second being the lugs on the bottom of the barrel here, using the uh, famous uh, double, the bolt, bolt with a, a double under lug, or a double bite um, bolt. And this green uh, cross bolt here provides a third um, uh, point of uh, lockup for the for the action, and these are actions are, are renowned for their strength and durability. Um, the fore end is also a little bit loose, and that's a consequence of the barrels um, moving forward a little bit uh, due to wear of the uh, <clears throat> of the hook and or the hinge pin. Um, you know, opening and closing the gun a thousands of times without adequate lubrication causes wear on those points and the, the barrels become loose and they can move actually longitudinally and that longitudinal movement also contributes to the forward being loose. So what we need to do is to uh, rejoint the gun which entails um, either building up the worn metal right here in the, in the hook and or replacing the hinge pin. Now, uh, there are several methods to do this. This particular action does not have a replaceable hinge pin. So um, that rules out replacing the hinge pin. We therefore need to add metal to this uh, hook here, uh, and there are, there are really three ways to do that. Um, the traditional way is to file out a tiny dovetail in that hook and to insert a new piece of um, steel into that dovetail, much as you would put front sight into a, 
a dovetail on a, on a rifle barrel, leaving the metal proud, and then work that metal down with files until the action just closes and is tight. Uh, the second method, which is a more modern method, is to use a TIG welder to build up the metal in this area. TIG welding generates very little uh, excess heat, so the heat affected zone will be limited and we won't uh, interfere with the brazing of the barrels or the soldering of the roots using a TIG welder. If you try to do that with any other kind of welder, not only are you going to make a mess, but um, you're going to uh, cause all sorts of things to melt in here, which aren't, aren't supposed to melt. So there's a third method, which uh, is a quicker method that I don't recommend, but uh, some folks do it, uh, perhaps on a low value gun. Uh, it's, it's acceptable, but I wouldn't do it on a, on a quality gun of any sort, and that is to, to upset the metal in this area um, to cause it to move forward. And you can do that basically by squeezing the metal at this point, and that's a fancy way of saying you hit it with a hammer. Uh, right there, a ball and pin hammer on both sides, or you could do it perhaps in a hydraulic press if you had one. Uh, just squeeze those two points and that'll cause this met met metal to bulge outward and that um, in turn will solve your problem, will give you enough metal to work with so that you can rejoint the gun. Um, once that's done, the fore end should tighten up because the barrels will move that away and that'll tighten up the fore end. Uh, fit. If, uh, sometimes it results in the fore end being too tight, in which case it's necessary to work off a little bit of um, metal on this on the back end of this uh, four end hanger here but we will um, probably not have to do that in this case is my guess it'll just tighten up nicely so uh, that's the scope of um, our project uh, our greener project and uh, I will uh, as usual break this up into episodes um, this restoration the first episode We'll deal with uh, the bruised uh, toe here, and we're going to refinish this part of the stock just lightly. I'm tempted to take the gun apart and uh, clean and lubricate the internals, because as I say, it doesn't look like it's ever been done. You've got to be careful, there's a fine line between lubricating that mechanism and getting the um, head of the stock soaked with oil. If you put too much oil into the gun, you're going to end up having that oil run into the wood, and that's going to blacken the wood here. And this gun shows almost no sign of uh, an oil-soaked uh, stock head, which is, again, tells me it, it's been, um, it hasn't been uh, messed with. So you've got to be very sparing on the use of, of oil. So it's possible to do a lot of lubrication without the complete disassembly of the action. I had to take the gun apart, you know, it has such beautiful screws. So uh, for that reason I'm probably just going to try to do what I can uh, with limited disassembly. All right, well, uh, that's it for uh, our intro. And uh, I will get on with uh, the stock work and we'll come back to that in episode two. All right, uh, let's proceed with the repair of the heel of the stock. I've uh, removed the butt plate here. 